the participants uh, here are uh, MBA students, uh, students from different campuses, about 30 to 40 percent of them are uh, young women professionals. Uh, most of you are at the threshold of either starting your careers or starting your formal uh, education, management education. And uh, I believe that uh, it is my privilege to share with you uh, just some perspectives. Um, these are not the answers to, to questions. Uh, these are uh, the seekings and the answers that I have obtained in my own life. And uh, if it is of use to you as you start your career, I'll be very happy uh, that it has been of some use to, to, to people uh, much younger and uh, those who have a lot more to achieve out of their lives. Uh, so today I'm, I'm going to, to use the, the example of the, of the Maggie crisis that happened to, to Nestle about five years ago as a kind of pivotal point uh, to answer probably three or four perspectives uh, that will come to your mind. Firstly, uh, how does a crisis hit? Uh, secondly, what are its dimensions? Uh, third is uh, how do you um, how do you tackle it in management terms? And for most of you, uh, I, I you will be happy to know that I am a jargonless man, so don't expect me to be your professor at I am. Uh, I will be talking to you with, without much jargon. And uh, finally, to, to leave you with some lessons in leadership, uh, things that I've learned, things that I've imbibed, things that have worked for me, uh, people that I've observed. And uh, as a consequence of that, uh, somehow managed to keep myself afloat and uh, whichever company uh, that I've worked uh, and whatever role I've been given uh, in order to keep that also afloat. Uh, so uh, this is really about about the the Maggie saga, and what I'm very very happy to to be doing today is I am uh, talking even without uh, seeing any of you. I'm talking to a hundred percent Maggie audience. I mean, you are all uh, the target group for Maggie. You are all those who are sworn by Maggie. You consume Maggie. The happy moments in your lives are Maggie. Uh, the comfort moments in your life are Maggie. You you have it with friends. You have it with relatives. You have it with loved ones. You have it just about any time of the day or night. I'm, I have been told that there are two o'clock, three o'clock Maggie parties. And uh, during your exam times, you are typically uh, kept awake with uh, Nescafe and with generous helpings of Maggie. And for those of you who are in, in, uh, in, in institutions where the hostels typically don't have particularly good catering, uh, Maggie becomes uh, your a passport between between life and not so good life uh, in whatever period of time that you uh, that you that you spend on on your, on your campus so therefore it is it is a brand that is that is close to your heart or at least it's a brand definitely that uh, that all of you have heard of so what is the what is about the first thing and then uh, since most of you are now entering the uh, the hallowed portals of your institutions to do your mba uh, you must be wondering uh, you know what uh, could there be a worse time to come into uh, to a business school uh, than now? Uh, for those who are graduating, you might ask the question, is there a worse time uh, to graduate than now? Uh, the future looks gloomy, uh, just as the prognostication on COVID, we don't know when it's going to end, how it's going to end, what loss it's going to bring. Uh, and yet, I think uh, somewhere along the, along the way, my friends, uh, my young friends, you need to have one simple lesson uh, in mind, which is really uh, what my first slide is. Uh, this is about a brand, a brand that is a very old brand, uh, but a brand that uh, is a much loved brand. And uh, one of the things that you need to remember is uh, brands and human beings are alike, that human beings are also brands. And uh, to that extent, brands bring with them uh, a very important dimension and uh, that begins with an A. It's called attitude. And one of the important ways in which human beings define themselves uh, is by having an attitude. And by attitude, I don't talk about in a negative sense. I talk about, talk about in, the, in the positive sense. And one of the attitudes of successful people, of people who are tenacious, uh, is that winners never quit. Uh, you know, it is not important, as Nelson Mandela once said, uh, what happens to you. It is more important what you do with what happens to you. Uh, my young friends, you cannot be 
held responsible for the COVID pandemic. Indeed, nobody in my organization could be held responsible for whatever happened on Maggie. And yet, it is what you do with what happens to you that is important. How do you internalize it? How do you face it? How do you cope with it? Uh, how do you go around it? And how do you prepare yourself for a tomorrow uh, that just might be more stormy than what today is? So when winners never quit, that speaks volumes for the attitude that an organization also takes. Now, Maggie is a, is, is a very old brand. It begins in 1983. I can safely say that nobody who's hearing this talk today, barring me, I would have been born uh, in 1983. I was actually working in 1983. And there are two things that happened in 83, which are, which are very, very interesting. The first is that, and it might seem so far away that you'll wonder that uh, we need to even talk about it. But it is a very important milestone uh, in that in 1983, India won the cup. Uh, this was a World Cup in the House of Lords where uh, Kapil Dev, that's the captain you see there, uh, he, uh, along with his formidable team, uh, we beat the West Indies. And uh, this was a time when uh, on the world scene, uh, India emerged as a cricketing power. Uh, before that, uh, we were not a great cricketing nation. We were a cricketing nation. But our greatness started in 1983. So much so that now when you talk about uh, the ICC, uh, you almost think it is the Indian Cricketing Council. And when you talk about T20s, you think that the game was discovered for India and was, was, was modified in India. When you think about the IPL, you almost think that IPL was born for India. And indeed, cricketing was born for this country. But that wasn't true. Uh, this was uh, as, as, as recently as 37 years ago. Uh, this was uh, still something that we were looking for. And the pride that all of us had as Indians uh, was seen to be believed. <clears throat> I, I could really hear this match on the radio because I didn't possess a television set at that time. There were very few television sets at that stage. There were no mobile phones. Uh, so therefore, you got the good news only from, uh, from the radio or indeed from the newspaper the next day. And the enormous sense of national pride, the pride to be Indians, uh, really came on the, on the sporting stage uh, when we won the World Cup. At the same time, uh, there was a, a Swiss company in India uh, that was called Food Specialities. And now it is called Nestle, but then it was called Food Specialities that did something very audacious. It decided to launch a noodle, an instant noodle, in a country where uh, we primarily consumed uh, chapatis and, uh, and rotis and parathas and, and rice. And, uh, you know, noodle was consumed largely or made uh, in one of the uh, areas around Kolkata uh, called Tangra, which was quite well known uh, for its uh, Chinese community. And they used to prepare these instant noodles and serve it to people. Uh, so it was very, very strange that a company would choose to launch an instant noodle, especially when uh, the views on eating uh, was quite set in this country. Uh, the North Indians always felt that the South Indians had idlis uh, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, that idli and dosa was about all that they ate. And the average concept of the South Indian was that the North Indian basically had chicken and parathas, and that's about all that, uh, that they had for food. Out of home, my young friends remember, there was no out of home. We had hardly any restaurants. So most of it was what mama made, uh, or what auntie made, or what grandmother made, almost akin to what we are all going through uh, in the work from home and in the stay from home, uh, stay at home during the COVID period. It's all what is made uh, at home. So at this time, uh, food specialities launched this uh, noodle, but the insight of the noodle was not the noodle. The insight was something else. The insight was that the most harrowing time for a mother, and uh, all of you are very young, so therefore, you know, none of I hope you can hear me. Yeah. The most harrowing time was is, is when uh, the child comes. Sorry. Sir. Yeah. Can you can you hear me now? You might have to put it back again. The share screen. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, sorry. So I just I just repeat what I what I just said. The insight was basically that uh, the mothers who were most harried when the kids came back from school, because when kids come back from school, they have uh, they are full of stories. Uh, they have all the conquests, all the great things that they did, uh, all the friends that they that they played with, all the all the tests that they conquered, all the people whom they beat up, all uh, those that attacked them, uh, whatever it is. Uh, it's an important occasion when children have to come and say all that they've done at school. Uh, it's also important for the mother uh, to be able to give uh, her son or daughter or her children uh, something, uh, something that is nourishing, something that gives them energy, and that prepares them for the next stage of their day, which is in those days, uh, 37 years ago, uh, surprise, surprise, children actually went out to play. I mean, uh, my life was spent in going out and playing. I didn't have an Xbox, I didn't have an iPhone, I didn't have any of these gizmos. I had to go and play, play and get thrashed by my friends or pulverize them as, as, as the case may be. And I came back home with scratches and bruises, uh, but after a, a very, very healthy round of exercise. Uh, so before kids went out, the mother had to give uh, the child something, uh, something uh, that was convenient, that was customizable, because the mother would like to give what she wanted to give. So she'd want to give a helping of egg, She'd want to give broccoli. She'd want to give cabbage. She'd want to give lettuce. She'd want to give, um, you know, some uh, some some paneer or or you know, whatever uh, she wanted uh, to give the child, which normally would be consumed. You know, a bowl of broccoli uh, to a ten-year-old uh, is not a particularly great idea. That a child will probably run into the room and, and lock himself up rather than subject himself to the torture of uh, of eating broccoli. But put that into a maggi noodle, and that tastes absolutely fabulous. And that's how. Uh, it became tasty, light, but filling. So the insight was convenient and customizable and also something that is tasty, light, but filling. And pronto came the noodle that was made very quickly. Uh, and the two-minute line actually became uh, the important line for the brand. And that has remained ever since. It's still called the two-minute noodles. A lot, of, a lot of things have woven around it, uh, but it is really something that, uh, that has uh, been here to stay. Uh, the brand, of course, began. Uh, it began uh, began small. Uh, it didn't begin big. People were trying to figure out what the hell this noodle is all about. Uh, but once they started to eat it, they started to love it. Uh, so the brand grew and grew and grew. It grew something like seven times in eight years. And my young friends, if you think that the food retailing revolution in this country was launched by a KFC or by a, by a Domino's or by a McDonald's, uh, your answer is, is uh, I, I most respectfully submit, is wrong. Uh, because the ones who started the retailing revolution were these small telawalas uh, who outside colleges, outside schools, outside cinema theaters, outside, uh, outside uh, bus stations, uh, put up these stalls uh, that served piping hot Maggie, made in the way in which the consumer wanted. And therefore, this became also a way of life. Uh, so if you have parts of the of the country, uh, you go to a place like Ahmedabad, you have a law garden, uh, which is full of baggy uh, shops. Uh, you go to, uh, you go up to the hills in Masuri, you find nothing but Maggi points, uh, all of which uh, sell Maggi. Uh, if you were to go to Delhi University, those of you who have studied there, uh, there is uh, Uncle Tom, uh, who, uh, who sells uh, almost 35 to 36 different varieties of Maggi. Uh, so all of this, of course, uh, they are the ones who made more money. I mean, I sell my Maggie for 10, 12 rupees, uh, but the Maggie that uh, that you buy is uh, at least 50 rupees, if not 100 rupees. And those of whom who are uh, even more indulgent uh, might look at uh, uh, one in Farzi Cafe, which sells for 400 bucks. Uh, it's Maggie with foie gras, right? So it's, a, it's even more exotic. But the fact of the matter is, uh, that's how this brand began. Uh, it became, uh, in, in a few years' time, a hot favorite. Uh, but remember, my young friends, one of the things you need to remember about life and about brands, it takes time to build. For the first 15 years, Maggie made a loss, right? I repeat it, it made a loss. We didn't make a single rupee of profit. Uh, it, it, it was all in the process of building the habit and building the salience with the, with the consumer. But the brand became, 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 became large, became big. Uh, and almost got a cult status. Uh, it became the most trusted food brand. 
It became the second largest FMCG brand. It became the most powerful brand. And like everything else, uh, my young friends in life, as you as you grow, as your as your career develops, uh, God willing, your opportunities come. You become more famous. As you become more famous, more wealth, more power, uh, more more fame comes to you, and you become a more and more and more important person. That's exactly what a brand does. So this brand also became uh, became famous, became uh, became a, a cult brand. Uh, it was, in fact, anecdotally said that after rice and wheat, the third most penetrated uh, product in this country, uh, people said was Maggie noodles. And a few years ago, when somebody was looking for uh, the dish that unites the country, uh, somebody talked about khichdi. Uh, but in a poll, it came out that seven out of 10 consumers said it is Maggie and not khichdi, uh, because that's what, for them, uh, was, was what was unifying this country together where everybody across the country ate the brand in their own uh, in their own manner so when that happens as in life you are successful you are doing well uh, sometimes and you're all too young but people like me ought to take uh, take care of ourselves uh, is when crisis strikes right uh, crisis doesn't come with a calling card it doesn't come and say you know tomorrow morning at 4 o'clock I'm going to be coming with a with a with a with a with a with a piece of bad news for you. Uh, crisis comes. It could be a illness. It could be a heart attack. It could be something. So you're a successful person. You're in your 30s. You're in your 40s, and you suddenly come with a heart attack. Uh, what happens to you? Again, remember what I just told you. It is not important what happens to you. It is what you do with what happens to you. So typically, at this when a crisis hits you as a human being you have either of two reactions. The first reaction is if you've got a serious health scare, you say, fine, okay, you know, I'm now, the time has come, the Lord is telling me that, you know, my time on the earth is, is limited and uh, let me kind of uh, moan and groan and cry and weep about whatever has happened to me. And most often than not, my young friends, the Lord is very kind to you. He takes you up very quickly because he decides that you are not worthy enough to fight life and in fact, to try and live as best as you can. But there are some others who look at this as a challenge and they say, I will change my lifestyle. I will take care of myself. I'll become a better human being and lead a more wholesome life, a more holistic life. And really, that's what, that's what a crisis is really all about. So when Maggie was struck, it was a large brand. It was almost a $500 million brand. It was arguably the, one of the biggest food brands in the country. It was iconic. It was ubiquitous. There was a huge love mark around it. Uh, we have millions and millions and millions of fans of Maggie people who swear by it, who love it, who look at it as part of their lives, who look at it as their friend, as their buddy. Uh, some people even tell me that they have their own conversations with a bowl of Maggie uh, because they feel that it's almost like a, like a pet in the house. Uh, somebody who's trusted, somebody who's, who's part of your, your being. 25% uh, of Nestle India, so that is what, uh, 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 that's the company that, uh, that, uh, that I have the privilege of working in. A fourth of Nestle India was, uh, was Maggie. Uh, it was an order opener. Uh, it became the best known in the trade. It's very ironic, my young friends, that the same brand that was vilified five years ago, uh, today is the most sought after brand in the COVID crisis. Uh, there are enough and more people who keep looking for, for, for Maggie uh, as a way to, to have uh, a breakfast, a lunch, a snack, or whatever else uh, that they want to cook up for themselves. And I know that there are millions and millions of bachelors and young people uh, who are, in fact, making a meal of Maggie uh, because that doesn't need too much of cooking skills. It just needs imagination and it needs a hearty appetite. And that's really what, what, what people have looked at. Uh, it was a brand that was much bigger. We had five factories, uh, four and a half thousand people directly employed. So it was a, it was a fairly significant operation. Uh, more importantly, we are amongst the top three procurers of wheat in this country. So after the biscuit uh, and the bread makers, uh, Maggie is the third largest procurer of wheat. Uh, we had more than 400,000 farmers uh, who grow the wheat and uh, we buy the wheat flour through uh, through millers. Uh, so that was the kind of spread that uh, the brand had. Uh, more than 1,500 distributors. So the number of distributors who, who have distributed our brands 
We take it across to almost four and a half million retailers, uh, thousands of vendors, uh, people, small suppliers, large suppliers, uh, running into, 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 into a couple of thousands, uh, these suppliers. So the, the footprint of Maggie is much, much bigger than the, uh, than the actual turnover of Maggie. Maggie, conservatively put, would be supporting a couple of million people at least and their families uh, in India today uh, by the amount of wheat, the packaging material, the spices, uh, the logistics, uh, the cartons, uh, various um, uh, outlets that uh, Maggie. Uh, all of this makes the brand footprint uh, much bigger than what it means to a company. So therefore, if, if Nestle took a hit on the on, on losses on Maggie five years ago, that loss, my young friends, was a very, very small part of the actual loss that took place because there were so many million people who lost their livelihoods. And I think that is, 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 is what a large brand does. What was the crisis all about? I'll not go through it. It was, it was basically a set of samples that was taken in a place called Barabanki. Uh, and there was an analysis that was done and... Uh, uh, the inspector said that this product contains monosodium glutamate when it actually doesn't contain MSG. Uh, MSG is, a, is, is chemically added. It is, it, is, it is found in natural form as sodium, so as sodium glutamate. And sodium glutamate is there in spices. It is there in onions. Uh, it is there uh, in the stuff that we put into, into to Maggie in a natural form. But the test for monosodium glutamate and sodium glutamate is the same. So when you test one, you, in, you test for the other. And if you want to twist it around, you can twist it around and say this contains monosodium glutamate. But monosodium glutamate can only be added in a manufacturing process. That has since been clarified after the Maggie crisis, but at that particular time, uh, there was, a, there was a, a grayness as far as the interpretation was concerned. So obviously this uh, uh, was considered to be something that was, uh, uh, that was a flaw. Uh, it, it went for a second analysis to Calcutta, and there something else turned up. So instead of monosodium glutamate, they said, uh, now this contains lead, and uh, lead is almost seven times the lead that is, uh, that is uh, permissible for, uh, for, uh, for human beings. Now, obviously, this was a complete uh, bolt from the blue. Uh, unfortunately, the whole testing methodology uh, and the way in which it was done was completely, uh, completely suspect. A test that takes 48 hours took only four months. Uh, the testing methodology, the way in which it was tested, the reagents used, uh, everything was, was very, very uh, shoddy. And unfortunately, uh, the typical result of something like this, you would normally take up with a company and you tell the company, look, there's a problem with, with your product. Uh, somebody decided to take it to the media instead. And that's when all hell broke loose. Uh, you are all my young friends, uh, not only the champions of social media, but also you are the victims of social media. So when something gets into the social media, uh, it can bring down, and if it is, especially if it is not correct news, and if it is, if it is uh, news that is today called fake news, uh, then that can really destroy the organization. So see what happened. Maggie had a consumer trust of 98%. So almost 10 in 10 people trusted the brand. The brand sold almost 15,000 tons per month, which means a couple of billion packets per month is what the brand uh, sold. In a matter of less than 10 days, see what happens. That's what happens. You see in front of the screen, it goes. That, my young friends, is what a crisis smells like. 25% of your company's turnover gone, five factories shut, 400,000 farmers asked to shut because we can't buy the wheat, millions and thousands of retailers can't distribute, consumers can't buy, and the company that has been known for 112 years as a company of the highest quality standards, suddenly becomes the absolute devil and the demon uh, amongst us. This was also the time when it was a perfect storm. Uh, there was no other news. There was no demonetization. There was no, uh, there was no COVID. There was none of these things that was that was happening. 
So every day and every every night, uh, it was news on Maggie. And Maggie is a very small brand compared to the many many mega brands uh, that is there in the country. But this is what happens. So in a, in every sense of the term, uh, this was a full blown crisis. Of course, the Maggie crisis it happened to uh, to to me and to my to my associates and uh, to uh, to to people working in my company. Uh, it didn't affect the nation completely. I mean, in the sense that consumers of Maggie, of course, got affected because they didn't get Maggie. But for a better part of the nation, it was the, the show was going on. There was nothing that was stopping. It's very much unlike the COVID crisis, where everybody on the planet is coming to a grinding halt. But when this happens, really, um, there are, you know, it's a it's a human issue. It's a business issue. Uh, it's an issue that is much much larger. Uh, than what any one single individual uh, can take on. And yet, that is the task of leadership. So, what are a few things that we do as, as, as managers, that you will do as managers? Uh, and I'll come, to, and I'll, I'll come to it very, very quickly. The first, of course, is uh, you, need to, <clears throat> you need to go back to understanding what your strategy uh, in this crisis will be. What are you going to do? At this point in time, I was that time posted in the in the, in the, in the Philippines, having just spent about uh, four months after having spent five years in the Arab Spring in Egypt. So I've I've seen a bit of crisis, my young friends, in my own life. Uh, but uh, um, you suddenly get the call saying that look, you have to go back to to India to take care of the of the Maggie crisis. Now this is this is a crisis that was far bigger than anything I've done, anything I've seen. But yet one of the few things that I always uh, kept as a principle in my life, in my career, has been that I work through people and I have an enormous amount of trust uh, in the quality, in the competence, in the diligence, in the dedication, in the passion of my people. So I came back. I came back and uh, decided to take, uh, along with my team, uh, this crisis head on. So we put together a strategy that was fundamentally around uh, three or four vectors. Number one, the consumer. Remember, we are a much loved brand. So for many people, it almost felt as if somebody has cheated. Uh, and that means that we have, to, we have to face the consumer with simple, straightforward communications. Uh, we did this, and in fact, contrary to what you will be learning in business schools, uh, that you normally don't advertise a brand if it is not on the shelf. Uh, we chose, in fact, to engage with consumers uh, because they were coming back in millions and telling us, we miss Maggie. Uh, I remember a young person, a young brand manager coming in and talking to me and she was not in Nestle, but she was working for a different company. And she said, I want to come and write short stories on Maggie. I said, why do you want to write short stories on Maggie? She said, I said, you know, it's, it's, it's just a two minute noodle. She said, sir, you don't get it. It's not a two minute noodle. Maggie was what I had when I came back from school. Maggie is what made me survive five years of engineering college two years of MBA, I survived because of Maggie, because that's what I used to make and eat. My boyfriend uh, first gave me Maggie, the cheapskate, couldn't afford anything else, so he gave me Maggie. He proposed to me with Maggie. We went on our, uh, we got married and we went on our honeymoon. The place was delightful, but the food was terrible. And guess what we ate? We ate Maggie. So therefore, this brand has been so much a part of my life uh, that I can't, I can't think of anything uh, other than Maggie as a tribute to pay to the brand and what it stood for me. So we decided when consumers came up in, in millions uh, saying we miss Maggie, we put out a whole series of ads saying we miss you too. And genuinely, me and my, and my team, we missed consumers because that is what in consumer marketing is the most exciting part. A happy consumer, a content consumer, a consumer says, I love Kit Kat, I love Nescafe, I love Maggie is what I wait to hear. Everything else, any accolades about me, myself, is not as important as what the consumer has love for your brand and love for your organization. Second element was, of course, customer. We had to take back all these stock uh, because uh, the FSSAI had chosen to, to ban us at that stage. And uh, this, is, this is a humongous task, humongous task because we distribute to four and a half million outlets. Uh, we, don't, we don't make uh, products to be taking it back from the, from the shelf. Now, this was this was huge. This was really, really big. But I think it is important uh, that uh, that we do this with all the respect 
all the ethics, all the dignity uh, that we have had for our consumer and for our customers uh, over many, many uh, decades in this country. Uh, there was competitive intensity. Obviously, this was a time when uh, another noodle was launched in the market by Patanjali. Clearly, uh, this was a nice empty space for a competition to come in. So for us to prepare ourselves uh, in terms of a response, uh, we went to court, we went to the Mumbai High Court uh, to, 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 to uh, appeal against the ban that had been put on us. Uh, by the grace of God, we won that appeal and, uh, and uh, thereafter decided to come back with Maggie after all the tests uh, that had been specified by the government. And finally, of course, and last but not the least, the people. Remember, this is, we are a proud company. You know, Nestle is a tenure company. For those of you uh, who may not know Nestle, most, many people in Nestle work for 15, 20, 25, 30 years. In fact, people even work 35 years. So every year I give to about 30, 40 people in our factory in Moga, which is our biggest factory in the Punjab. I give about 35 people 35 year awards. Uh, you may think in your, in your generation, my young friends, you may think it is foolish. How can you spend 35 years in a company? Uh, but when people love a place, when they resonate with the purpose and they believe that they have a decent life, uh, they continue to stay. And that's what maybe your parents have, uh, wherever they have worked, uh, where I have, because I've also been for a long time, and where people of a certain generation choose to be. Uh, and when a company gets hit <clears throat> by something like this, uh, it can be really devastating. It, it, it hurts, it hurts the the self-respect of people, it, it, it hurts their self-worth, they doubt their self-worth, that have I been doing something that is, that is illegal or that is bad or that is, that is harmful? And, uh, and really, um, a, a strategy around uh, people uh, for a leader is a strategy to be a brother, to be a colleague, to be a father, uh, to be an uncle, right? Uh, because people uh, have to heal. It is like what we have today. In the COVID crisis, when companies are looking at taking out jobs or making people lose their jobs, it is a it is a traumatic moment for everybody. So at least as Nestle, I have announced to my team that none of you will lose your jobs because I don't think we are in the business of taking away the self-respect of people because jobs are more than incomes. They're also self-respects. And I think that self-respect is something that we cannot ever compromise as a company because our values are based on respect. So therefore, uh, that's something that we stick to. So we look at different stages, um, and I won't go through that because that's not the purpose of this presentation, uh, of really looking at uh, what is the gap between what we think we know about the crisis and what are we doing about the crisis. Uh, we, we, we evaluate as a management team, is the organization even, even ready? Uh, to be able to go through this crisis well. There are different aspects of it, the business environment, people, process, et cetera. But the third part is how do you know success from failure? Uh, you are in a storm, my friends. You are surrounded by, by howling winds. Uh, you can't see the path ahead. And yet you have to evaluate whether you're coming out of the storm or you are getting deeper into it. And last but not the least, how do you gain a momentum? How do you get your people, how do you get your structure to start working after you are coming out of the storm? It's almost like the preparation for post lockdown. How are we going to get ourselves started as a, as a people and how is that going to happen? So these are the management elements of it. And this you will learn more about in your business schools. Uh, I'm sure Maggie is, 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 is taught as a case study, I believe in, in many of the schools on, on, on managing a crisis. So I won't dwell much on it, but I'll come to the core of what I want to spend the next half an hour of my presentation, which is really on leadership. My young friends, you are all young. You're all, you're all bright. You all have aspirations. You all have ambitions. You all have goals. And yet the good thing about life is that if you work hard with purpose, you can get ahead. The bad thing about life is that sometimes you don't get what you want. Uh, some of us who have been in the trenches for a long time, I worked for almost 40 years now. I can tell you there were many things I had as, as a dream. Uh, many things.
if you are put in the center of a crisis, if you are given a team of two people or a team of 200,000 people, how do you manage yourself? What are the few things that you need to look at? Today, you are young students. You're getting into business schools. Some of you have got into the top business schools in the country. You look forward to an enormous career ahead. And suddenly you're hit by a COVID crisis, a pandemic. The economy is melting down. Jobs are being lost. It looks like it will be a long, long time before the ship gets back into, into the sea with any degree of confidence, with any degree of, of effort. Now, this is the time when really you need to look at yourselves and, and, and how are you going to manage yourself? How are you going to handle yourself? The answers, my young friends, will have to be from within you. Your parents, your teachers, your friends can advise you, but ultimately it is you who's going to make that difference. So what are a few things in life that, that I've learned, which I think is, 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 is important and that could be of, of, of some meaning to you? The first I call as the triad of life. Firstly, you're all people who are starting your careers. Have a purpose. Have something that is a burning passion that you have. Something that defines you. Not being a manager, not being assistant manager, not being president, not being chairman. You know, those are all acronyms and those are all manifestations of what a end point looks like. But your purpose, what would you like to be known for? What would you like to do with your lives? What would you like to contribute? How would you like to contribute? And this is more than just becoming rich and famous and owning a lot of property and a lot of cars and a lot of other things. Those are all manifestations. But ultimately, look at what your purpose is. Look at the organizational purpose. You all will be going as summer interns to some organizations. You will go as management trainees. You will go as executives. You will start your own organizations. Set the course of your organization. What should your organization be known for? Not that it will make a lot of shareholder wealth and we'll have blah, 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 return on invested capital. We'll have this uh, shareholder value. We'll have this share price. Those are all manifestations. What will your people be like? What will your purpose be like? What is the place smell like? When you come into an office of your organization, of your company, that you wish to join? What is the spell of the place? Is it a place that you're comfortable with? And finally, a national purpose. I think all of us and all of you on the call are truly blessed people. We have been blessed with good education, with good families, with good values, with good purpose, uh, with good intentions. We've all been given decency, decency as part of our behaviors and respect as human beings. So it's very, very important that you give back to society. Your generation, I must say, uh, is far, far more giving and far, far more conscious than any other generation that we've had in this country, including mine. Uh, but it is important that as you set sail, you marry your purpose with your organizational purpose, with your national purpose, because your life must be a life worth living, not just in terms of the material wealth that you make, but also in terms of the number of people uh, that you have positively influenced, that you have positively helped. Uh, that's at least the way I looked at my own life, that how many people can I help? Uh, my reason for talking to you today is, 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 is purely to try and help. Uh, it is not to seek anything. It is not to ask anything, because I believe uh, that that is not the time for me. That is a time that was passed, and that is a time that has gone. And that brings me to a beautiful Japanese concept it's called Ikigai. Uh, ikigai is fundamentally means what is your, uh, what is your being? What is your purpose? Uh, it was found in Japan. It is a beautiful book uh, that is there that you would all like to, to read. Uh, when they found in the island of Okinawa, a uh, majority of, of, of people in a community were centenarians, were more than 100 years old. They asked these people, how, do you, how have you lived so long? And how are you so happy? And they said, we've all done whatever was our calling, whatever was our passion, whatever defined our being. And I think it's important to find your Ikigai. Your Ikigai, if it is not to be a marketing manager, uh, you should not keep that as your Ikigai simply because uh, your colleague or your friend is going to become a marketing manager. If you want to be an HR manager, if you want to be a trainer, if you want to be a musician, if you want to be, I don't know what, 
an, an artist, if that is what drives you, that is what will drive you. Because if you do it with an enormous amount of passion, and if you do it with an enormous amount of dedication, I can tell you, my young friends, you will be successful. There's no way. I mean, a, a brilliant musician uh, will always be brilliant, irrespective of the quality of the, of the, of the audience, uh, because that's what has defined him. So what are some of the toughest battles that you have? The toughest battles is not your job interviews. The toughest battles is not the interviews that you've been through to get into B school. The toughest battles are uh, between the six inches of your two years and lies in your head. And I think that is the toughest battle that you have. What is the, 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 the first battle that you have is attitude. What is the attitude that you want to take in your lives? Do you want to take an attitude that is positive, optimistic, hopeful, giving, and that is receptive? Or do you want to take an attitude that is selfish, that is closed, that is pessimistic, that is bitter, and that always looks at the wrong ends of, 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 of what uh, the line is defining for you? So it's very, very important how you set your attitude and what you do about this attitude. There is, and I am a great lover of, 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 of the poet Kabir, and there are some Kabir Dohas that are extremely evocative uh, for, for, for attitude. And one of, the, one of the Dohas that Kabir talked about, he said, Bura jo dekhan mai chala, bura na milia koi. Jo dil khoja apna, utsa bura na koi. Look at yourselves, introspect on yourselves. What are the things that I can do better? What are the things that I can learn? Have an open mind. An open mind is like a sponge. It will keep absorbing things. And I think it is important to absorb because as you absorb, you will learn. And as you learn, you will improve. All of us, my young friends, we've all started small. I'm talking to you today after having spent four decades working. I didn't start as chairman and managing director. I started as a small trainee. I didn't even know management. I have, a, I have a degree in economics uh, from Delhi University. I never went to an MBA school. I didn't know a lot of what you people know today or will be knowing today, but I learned the hard way. And I kept my mind open. I kept myself receptive. I kept myself humble. And thereby you learn a lot more. Have ambition. Don't shortchange yourself. Don't believe that ambition is bad. Ambition is good, but it is a calibrated ambition. Know how much to aspire for know how much to seek, know how much to get. So as you get into your business schools, as you study in business schools, evaluate yourselves. Look at yourself vis-a-vis -vis your peer group. I know sometimes when, when, when group discussions begin, everybody rushes to make the first remark. And a few of you trying to make the most clever remarks, even though it sounds as if you've mugged up a whole thesis to make that remark. Be, be yourself, be natural. Everybody notices people who are natural, people who are calm, people who are collected, and people who make sense. So have that ambition and don't allow yourself to be shortchanged. Ability. Remember that you can only rise with your ability. Ability is a constant process of learning, of relearning, of calibrating, of recalibrating. You have to keep doing this all your lives not just in your MBAs, but after your MBAs as well. In fact, Kabir said this beautifully. He said, Jati na poocho sadhu ki, pooch lijiye gyan, mol karo talwar ka, pada rahen do gyan. Don't ask the caste of the, of, the, of the holy men, right? Ask for the knowledge that he has. Just as don't trade the scabbard, but trade the sword and the power of the sword. So it is the same with you. Your power will be predefined because you are in a different age. And in this age, knowledge and knowledge alone and ability and ability alone will define the winners of the future. Not people with intentions, but people with ability. Articulation. Remember that sometimes we say, look, I'm not a great speaker. Nobody is a great speaker. None of us became great speakers. We all were put into the deep end, asked to rest for two people, but are not like people like Mr. Modi with a natural instinct and ability to speak. Some of us don't have it, but some of us do have it. Develop it. It is important. 
articulation is an important part. But more than articulation, what you speak, how you speak it, right? Because sometimes we believe that speaking arrogantly or speaking in a in a very in a very in a in a, in a very uh, abrasive way uh, is a very effective way of of, of communication. Uh, don't do that. Don't do that because that's not a very good way of getting across. Decency, respect, modulation, and maturity are important characteristics of would-be managers. And keep that. Keep it that way. Adversity. You are in moments of adversity. And let me tell you one thing, my young friends. Adversity is the best teacher. When I was posted here in 2015 as the managing director of Nestle, one of the first audiences that I had were a group of management trainees. I looked at those management trainees and I said, you must be wondering, my God, what a terrible future I have. I've joined a company that is on fire. I've joined a organization which is in absolute turmoil. What future can I expect in this organization? But I told these young people, there were about 18 of them. I said, look, my young friends, you will learn more in the next one year than you will learn in the rest of your life because adversity is the best teacher. During this period, you will find your strengths. You will find your weaknesses. You will, you will introspect on what you need to do. You will find the right opportunities and also you'll find the right meter and the right caliber that you're seeking in yourself. When things are going well, Ariali mein tote bahut bolte hai. But it is when the chips are down that the men from the boys, the women from the girls are separated. And that is the time when you have to put your best foot forward. And yes, in adversity, I would just like to advise my young female colleagues out here and young professionals here. You have a big task. Many times I, I, I say this, I don't say this negatively towards men, but I always believe that men sometimes are 100% confident and 50% prepared. Women are 100% prepared, but only 50% confident. Don't allow that to happen to you. You are confident, you are capable, and you are able to conquer this world. Remember that even in the COVID crisis, as you might have read, the most effective leaders, most of them are women leaders. So therefore, don't shortchange yourself. Don't allow yourself to be on a secondary path. You can be on the first path and you should be on that first path. What are, what are some of the, the winning moments and how does one win every moment? I believe that everyone is a winner. Firstly, winning is not an absolute. Don't look at an end goal and say that is winning. Winning is a journey. Sometimes you achieve it, sometimes you don't achieve it. Have the humility to accept that sometimes you will have failures and sometimes you'll be successful. You may be pitching for a job and you'll think that if I don't get this job, I'm useless. Never look at it that way. Today, you are in a volatile environment. You are in an environment where you have to be realistic to accept the kind of jobs that come your way. Looking for perfection, seeking perfection is far away, my young friends. Take what comes, because when you work with what comes, you will do your best. And when you do your best, you will get noticed. That is more important than worrying about what is very good and what is not very good. Acceptance is an inspiration for action. When you accept that there is a problem, when you accept that there is a challenge, then you do a better job of it. So accept that challenge. Acceptance is an inspiration for action. Many times we don't accept it. We say, look, I have no problem. I'm a great guy. I'm very good in whatever I'm doing. But the fact of the matter is that that's not necessarily the case. So you have to be able to look at yourself and learn and accept it that this is an area that I need to act upon. Perspectives revolve around values and your purpose. Ultimately, my young friends, you will all lead a good life. But at the end of your life or when you decide to introspect, you will ask the question, have I led a good life? Have I made an impact? Have I lived to my values? Have I lived to my purpose? Whatever that is, you have to answer your own conscience. You don't have to, to publicize it and, and answer the world, but you have to answer yourself. And at that time, when you have the right answers and when you feel happy about it, when you feel comfortable in the skin that you are in, it is something that will help you to live better. Your Ikigai is for you and not to make comparisons. 
we are in a comparative competitive world we keep making comparisons in 10 years what will i be or in 10 years sarbojit has become this in 20 years sarbojit has become this i am not become this so therefore sarbojit is better than suresh don't do this if you are going to do this welcome to the world of ulcers you will have very quickly ulcers right serious gastric issues you might even land up with a heart attack you will have frayed relationships lousy relationships you'll keep coming back home every day and barking at your wife barking at your children right uh, simply because some promotion has eluded you is that a life worth living i don't think it is so if you live for what drives you you become a much much better human being a much better person and don't make comparisons everybody has their own path don't envy that path because that path may be having in it a lot of thorns that you may not see and therefore sometimes making comparisons is not particularly clever your ego is your enemy number one of winning unfortunately the more and more and more you cultivate this animal called ego the worse off you are again kabir had a beautiful doha he said jab mai tha mai means ego jab mai tha tab hari nahi ab hari hai mai nahi jab mai tha when ego was there god wasn't there now god is there and my ego is gone sab andhyara mit gaya jab deepak dekhe mai all the darkness in my life has been dispelled when i looked at my inner self and realized what a weak person i was ego kills ego destroys ego doesn't help it doesn't it it helps to have a healthy blood pressure it doesn't help to have an extra high blood pressure that is the way you need to look at it and if you have too much of an ego unfortunately you never win remember what the dalai lama once said he said the advantages of humility are that number one when you speak what you know you repeat what you know when you don't speak and hear you hear new things that is the power of keeping your ego in check so you will find a different playing field every time i will not go through this in any great detail because this is something that that you will you will work with if you are going to look at winning whatever you do in working in an organization you'll have people you'll have process you'll have planning and and you'll have purpose and fundamentally your role as leaders would be to inspire will be to define how we win as a team as a group how do you stay the course how do you ensure that you are within the 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 bounds of whatever you are doing and finally what is your reason to be more often than not my young friends you notice that great corporations collapse not because of lousy strategies they collapse because of lousy leadership the irish have a very good saying the fish rots from the head so when the head of the organization or when the leadership of the organization is flawed the organization suffers and therefore it is important that keeping the people and purpose with leadership is so very important so in summary what are some of my learnings which i would like to share with you today build your ikigai early and hone it over a period of time it's important that you identify what is it that drives you and work on it during your mba after your mba during your careers as best as you can accept that failing to succeed is essential for succeeding to succeed you will sometimes fail to fail is not bad to fail is not a sign of 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 a human defeat failures sometimes teach you a lot more about what it takes to succeed next your team will define success and winning life is not about i me myself life is about a team the head of a pack of lions has to be a lion it can't be a monkey in the same way if you define yourself by the contribution and by the role that you can play in inspiring in enabling and empowering your team you will always come across winning and success when sarbojit talks about by coming here on the maggie crisis and doing whatever i have done it is not me my friends it is more than 7000 people who have worked extremely hard to make it happen that is important it is arrogance if i tell you that i have done it 
I have been one cog in the wheel, but an important cog in the wheel. I guess if I, I must acknowledge the role that leadership plays, but leadership is not all. It is about the people that make it. Don't take yourself too seriously. I always believed this is called rule number six. Have a healthy laugh about you, yourself, about your frailties, about the things that you're not particularly good at, because that keeps you humble. Humility is good. Humility is good because of two things. Number one, it keeps your expectations in check. And number two, it makes you approachable. People will come and talk to you. People will say, Ye to hai. he's a human being like us. And I think that is very, very important. If a leadership is too distant, again, it is, it is, it is, it is, it is an important characteristic. If you are too far away from your people, then there is no point in calling yourself a leader. You'll never know what the real situation and what the real issues are. Constantly learning keeps your purpose burning. Constantly learn, constantly improve yourself. Constantly educate yourself. Constantly seek out wise people. Constantly seek out people who can teach you a few things because that is important. Every cloud has a silver lining. The darkest night precedes the brilliant dawn and therefore always be optimistic. Optimism keeps your blood pressure right. Optimism keeps your mind right. Optimism keeps your heart right. Optimism keeps your compass right. Optimism is what will help you come out of the darkest storm that you're going through. So when today you look at yourself and you say, oh my God, what am I heading in for? Be optimistic. You don't have to have all the answers. Nobody does. But you have to have a path for yourself and you have to guide yourself out of this, this difficult situation. Think win, do win. If you think of winning, you will win. If you think of losing, you will lose. I have seldom come across in my career somebody who thinks win and loses or thinks losing and, and wins. It rarely happens. And therefore, if you think win, you can do win. Tenacity defines victory. You have to be like the famous Robert Bruce poem. You have to be like the spider that keeps coming down and falling and go, climbs back again, climbs back again. Tenacity defines victory. You will not get all that you want to achieve in one fell sweep. You will not achieve it in one year. You will not achieve it in five years. You may take 10 years, 20 years, but keep at it. If that is your purpose, keep at it. Ultimately, you will get there. Compassion and humanness at the core. I keep saying that we have become a world that has become fractured. Fractured because of arrogance. Fractured because of hubris. Fractured because of greed. Fractured because of racial prejudices, gender pre prejudices, right? A geographic prejudices, a climate prejudices, you name it, you name it. And the result is that when you go through a crisis of the kind that you and I are going through today, we have to introspect. Is this what humanity is all about? Is this what is the price to pay for all the plunder and for all the greed that we have shown in all these years? Where has compassion gone? Where has humanness gone? And I believe as leaders, I would only appeal to you. Compassion and humanness are at the core. In all my years, I have never given up on a target. I have never given up on an objective, but I have always tried to be compassionate and always tried to be human because ultimately I look at that mirror every morning and I say to myself, this human being is worth it. This human life that you're leading is worth it because this is within the purpose and values that you have got. And last but not the least, my young friends, life is like a thali meal, right? And I'm sure some of you are, are having that or making that in your, in your homes. You have many dishes. You have many experiences. Savor it and taste it. Don't just wait for the dessert. Don't just wait for the rice. Don't just wait for the chapati. Have everything that goes with the thali meal because that will what is what will make your life enriching. That is what will make your life successful. So I want to thank you all for your patience in listening to me. I want to extend to you my very best wishes and my blessings as you go out and seek your fortune in this world. Remember two things, everybody has started small and every good thing will come to an end. So we've all started small, we've all started humble, we've all achieved whatever we have achieved by the grace of God and by the hard work that we have put in and by the collective efforts of our team. And remember that if you lead the, the life and if you look at your own lives, 
in a particular perspective, then success will always be defined by what you want to write in the book, not by what is written in the book. So good luck and God bless all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suresh. I mean, um, we wanted a lesson, the master class in crisis management, and we got that. And we also got a master class in humility and essential life skills. I mean, just that last ten minutes and the last two slides. I think, I mean, any, I mean, that not just MBA students are at the beginning of your career at every stage. I think it's something it's a refresher for all of us. Thank you so much for this. Uh, we've got tons of questions, but I know we are also, uh, you know, we are past the time that we are committed to. Uh, would you be okay with taking a couple of questions? Uh, sure, another another five ten minutes is fine with me. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, so three sets of questions. One set of questions is a bucket, you know, which are typical, uh, you know, business questions about you know supply chain and future of Nike and brand this thing. And then another set of questions on attitude and you know how to manage this. And there's a third set of questions, which is people who just love Maggie. So they want to know why is Maggie not available to them or when will Maggie be available? There's one interesting question on has the Maggie masala changed? So those are, that's the bucket, which is people who love Maggie. So I'm sure you get that everywhere you go. Uh, but I'll start with Arunab's question. It's a very interesting question. He says to the batch of 2020, uh, especially the people who are getting into FMCG sales, because a lot of uncertainty there, both in terms of the distribution of it and what's going to happen next. Uh, your words of advice the batch of 2020 about look i think look i i, I believe that uh, consumer goods is a is an excellent uh, is an excellent choice as an industry not not because i have spent 40 years in it but i think it is a, it is a place where you can satiate uh, your your desires as a great marketer or as a great supply chain or whatever you want to work in uh, it's a place where uh, you know we can have its up and uh, ups and downs, but it is still a sector that will be relevant. I don't think consumers have found a way to eat uh, gigabits and keep themselves full. Right? They still need food. They still need food. Uh, they still need toiletries. They still need uh, soaps, and they still need whatever else. Uh, and uh, the third thing is, is I think uh, uh, consumer goods is also exciting. Uh, it is tough, but it is exciting. Uh, those of you who are looking at consumer goods, therefore, I think you should. Uh, you should you should certainly uh, pitch for it. Uh, and my advice to you is uh, is uh, to start in sales. Uh, however difficult that might look, or however uh, daunting uh, a stint in sales might look, uh, I can tell you from my own experience. I started my career in sales and spent a good amount of time in sales. And I can tell you my business sense, uh, if I have any, uh, comes from my 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 stint in sales. So. Uh, I think it's important to understand the consumer, understand the customer, understand the channel, work the markets. Uh, I'm an old school person. I've done 30 calls a day, 40 calls a day. That's how I've grown my career. Maybe maybe nowadays youngsters don't do as much of it, uh, but it is important for you to keep the pulse because beyond the data and analytics, uh, you need something called judgment. And that judgment is not uh, randomized. It comes from experience and from looking at, 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 at perspectives in markets over many years. So uh, I, would, I would really commend you to it and, uh, and good luck to you. Uh, Joel has another interesting question. Uh, he said that since you spoke about purpose and passion, uh, what happens if your team doesn't align to your purpose and passion? How do you create common purpose? How do you motivate them? Look, I think it's a, you know, a, a team is always a, it's, it's a two-way dialogue. Uh, number one is uh, if you have clarity on the purpose and values that you, uh, that you espouse, uh, then number one is you need to have a very clear communication on what those purpose and what those values stand for in tangible terms uh, to your team members. And number two, remember that every human being has a purpose and has a motive. So members of your team, their motive is what's in it for me. And that's your job as a leader to explain to them, if we have this purpose and if we have this set of values, what's in it for you is one, two, three, four. Because once you do that, and once I know, once, once Suresh can explain to Sarvajit that the purpose and values of our organization is this, and incidentally, Sarbhojit, this is what is in it for you because this is the way you look at it. Sarbhojit is likely to say, yes, I think it makes sense. 
but if your purpose and values are completely um, uh, distanced from what the organization stands for uh, then maybe it's time for you to to relook at it because maybe it's not relevant in the context of where the organization is there's another interesting question from somya uh, so she says that some i mean and i'm going to add a little bit to her question as well is that sometimes in crisis you know you get tempted to take a shortcut or maybe do something that's unethical because at that time it feels like maybe that's an easy way out and you know uh, to feel less pain or to ensure the cut is less deeper uh, as an organization uh, so how do you manage that piece because i'm sure there is temptation i mean uh, either there would be suggestions or there would be uh, you know so how do you curb that temptation because i mean we know in the long run that never works but at that point when you just see the crisis and you want to way out uh, there could be temptation so what happens how do you manage look i think uh, you know you know every every human being whether he is a senior leader or a junior leader must have his or her own moral compass and that moral compass uh, it defines to you not only the direction but it also tells you what are the degrees of freedom that you give yourself uh, so if there is a degree of compromise that is just too much or too it south as compared to the north that that uh, that is shown uh, as far as your ethics and behavior is concerned then clearly you can't do it because remember one thing ultimately whether or not you admit it and whether your ego admits it or not you answer to your own conscience every single day if you have done something which is patently unethical or goes against the principles <clears throat> that you have defined for yourself then it is going to be rankling you and like a thorn in the flesh for a long long time that's why you have catharsis that's why you have people uh, who who erupt and they say look i can't take it anymore why do they say i can't take it anymore <clears throat> they can't take it anymore because there's a dissonance between their actions and their conscience so <clears throat> if you believe that your conscience is clear and you're taking something which you think is a mild misdemeanor that fine so long as your conscience doesn't hurt you back it's okay but if you think it is a misdemeanor that is going to hurt you for a long long time please don't do it because you will be ruining yourself forget what you do to the team you be ruining yourself and at least for that one action you need to be selfish and say how does it affect me so rish i'm going to end with a concluding question and that's my question um, and you know most leaders across organizations not just fmcg but across uh, you know who know you say that you are the ultimate leader in crisis almost like that war time president uh, you never break into a sweat nothing flusters you you never get angry in fact you're almost waiting that let a crisis come and you know i will solve this one as well what's your trade secret i mean you know how is it that you know no, no. nothing changes i mean none of i i am not i am not sarvajit in the mode of uh, self flagellation so i don't i don't i don't particularly enjoy uh, uh, getting getting crisis on my head but a few things that uh, that i have always been and maybe it is temperament maybe it's the way i am Uh, number one is i'm i'm by and large very calm by nature i don't i don't i don't fluster myself uh, too much uh, number two i trust in my people and i and i and i do work with people a hell of a lot uh, number three is for me dignity and respect are extremely important uh, the guy who serves me coffee and the chairman of my company globally receives the same amount of dignity and respect from me uh, i don't make any distinction on that because i have no business being disrespectful i mean economic circumstance the family in which you are born and how you have developed in your life uh, are sometimes consequences of decisions and actions others have taken but that doesn't give me the primacy it doesn't give me the 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 the, the kind of uh, the kind of uh, arrogance uh, to be able to uh, to disrespect people so i i i i i don't do that and i think as a consequence of this i, I do keep my uh, my own ego in check that i don't allow myself to run ahead uh, i have as i said uh, uh, a kind of a way of laughing at myself uh, i also have family members who 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 also laugh at me right so therefore i i keep myself in check all the time and uh, i think try and do the best i can and, and and that's really what i'm just a normal guy leading a normal life and uh, and uh, have an enormous amount of gratitude for Uh, all the loving relationships and for the respect 
uh, that I have been given by my team members. I mean, I don't know how to ever thank them, but I've received so much more than I can ever give. And uh, therefore, I'm now in the indebted mode. I, I try and pay back my debt by talking to young people to at least share with them uh, my own journey. Thank you so much, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sir. And thank you for everyone who's attended. I'm sure it's been an absolute delight. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.